Today in the studio with me, I have Tamta Gamzardashvili. Uh, Tamta is the founder of Unorthodox Ventures, an advisory firm that leads capital raising strategy for VC funds. In today's episode, we talked about the fact that VCs struggle to raise too. The inferiority complex amongst investors, uh, leveling out the power dynamic. And they found themselves in a very kind of um, um, tricky situation where their ego kicks into play. Uh, they don't really feel comfortable asking for money. They feel like they are inferior to those potential investors because they're begging for money. How people buy from people, why everyone should have equal op opportunities, but maybe not equal rights in those opportunities. Equality is something that when, when everyone has equal opportunity, if not the right to go for things that they want to go for, mm. whether it's a role, job role, or whatever else. Uh, there is a difference between how men ask for money versus how women do, how Tamta is bringing women back into the kitchen, uh, and from a dinner for four women to over 3,000 people across the platform after 12 months, and Tamta's contrarian conviction asked the question first. Let's get straight into it. This is Nothing Ventured with me, Arish Shah, the podcast where I talk to the people behind the stories that make the venture capital ecosystem go round. I've been working with startups from pre-seed to series C for the last decade, and companies that I've worked with have gone on to realize value and exit, or raise funds in excess of half a billion dollars. I really hope you enjoy the episode, and if you have a guest that you'd love to see me have on, or you have a comment on any of the episodes that I've recorded so far, do reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'd love to hear from you. Let's get straight into it. Tanta, thank you so much for joining me. It's a real pleasure having you in the studio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Cool. Um, let's dive straight in. So the philosophy behind Unorthodox Ventures is bringing psychology into fundraising from LPs for VCs. Can you expand on what drove you to build this offering and what it was that you saw VCs doing wrong or badly, as well as what emerging managers might need to look out for today in the current environment? Yeah, totally. I mean, to be honest, the offering was very much shaped shaped by the market. Mm -hmm. So when I left tech industry, I didn't really have any specific idea on what I wanted to do uh, or what kind of business I wanted to start. I wanted the market to dictate it. I did know that I wanted it to be something where I could kind of um, transfer my skill sets from my previous kind of experience in tech as a sales exec, but also something that was more fresh, something where I could have a bigger impact on. And quite shortly after I left, in a couple of weeks' time, actually I had one of the VCs approach me and say, hey, we're really struggling with fundraising process. Could you come and help us? And for me, it was a little bit of... I, I was pretty confused, to be, to be honest, because to me, these people are who, who are starting, majority um, of the people who are starting venture capital funds, or already have built it out and doing different raises. They have investors' experience. A lot of them have institutional investor background, and they also know people in the industry. So fundraising should it should be second nature, right? I thought, yeah. hey, like you know, shouldn't be that hard. But actually, I was so so wrong. Now that's where the whole also understanding people and their psychology and the background really kicks in too, because these. These GPs were always the ones with the money, funding other businesses, but they were really never the ones asking for money. And they found themselves in a very kind of um, um, tricky situation where their ego kicks into play. Uh, they don't really feel comfortable asking for money. They feel like they're inferior to those potential investors because they're begging for money. Um, and they also don't know where to start. They don't have a process, they don't have a technology where you capture those potential leads and really run them through the sales process because really, let's face it, fundraising is a sales it's process. It's a pipeline, yeah. It's a pipeline. <clears throat> you have your CRM system, ideally, <laughs> please do. Um, and where you capture, okay, like what is it, Irish, wh what kind of sales process I want you to run through with me and my fund or, or you know, a startup, it doesn't really matter, it's all the same. and then you break it out. But then that's a very kind of corporate 
aspect of it. So you have stages, how many calls do you want to have? What kind of calls do you want to have? What kind of meetings? How many would it take to really convert that potential investor? But then on top of that, the most important part, and that's where we really differentiate, is how we do it and how much attention we pay to their actual personalities and the backgrounds. We are all from different cultures, different countries who had different upbringings. We were exposed to various experiences when it comes to, you know, observing what our parents did. Were they entrepreneurial? Were they not? Were they corporate? Were they, um, you know, did I not have parents at all? Did I have an education or not? Or was it formal? Was it? So all of these things, it forms us into individuals that we are today. Therefore, we are receptive to various approaches. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you're more likely to identify with people that come from similar backgrounds. Yeah, uh, and, and or, or intrigued yeah. by them, right? Uh, and it could be that uh, you have something I don't have, and that's my investment thesis or thing. That's my success criteria. I want you to fill my gaps, or I want you to challenge me or get me excited. I want to feel cool and sexy if I invest in your fund, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so all of these things, th and it's really a play on... How, how do you dress when you go to into that meeting with that person? So it's a visual. Um, you know, how what what is your tone of voice? Like, what, what kind of language do you use? Is this person quite academic or is it quite relaxed? Are you going to wear a suit or are you going to turn up in jeans? All these things really matter. And I think a lot of people that, not just in the venture capital world, but in general who are in sales, and let's face it, most of us are in sales, so yeah. whether we like it or not. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's um, like the most fundamental skill that everyone needs is how do you sell? Like, exactly. <laughs> whether it's yourself, a product, or a fund, or whatever, right? Like We do it every saying. single day. Yeah, or to your partner, or potential partner, or whatever, yeah. Exactly. And th th these things matter. If you want to have kind of a warmer kind of head start w with with those relationships and with the, on those deals. Yeah. And <clears throat> so, I mean, in terms of the kind of psychology that you bring to the table there, right? So I think what's really interesting is a couple of things. So first, you know, <clears throat> the fact that, and, and I think a lot of founders wouldn't necessarily appreciate this, that inferior, inferiority complex, as you described it amongst VCs that, okay, they've never, they've never been on the other side of the power dynamic, right? Like that is, that is essentially the problem. Yeah. So, so partly there is that, okay, how do you present yourself and how do you, how do you, how do you, I guess empathize with the LP and and find a way to um, you know to to uh, I guess tick the boxes that they're looking to tick right, which is a function of how much do you know about them, what do you mm -hmm. know about their previous investment thesis, what do you know about um, who they've invested re in recently, and 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 all of those sort of things. But then there is equally how do you help VCs and I guess to that extent founders get over that power dynamic problem where you're meeting people where you where you essentially have to meet people on the same terms even if you feel like you're you're slightly down uh, further down the, the the pecking chain like how how do you help i guess gps founders whoever it may be to get over that complex and and walk in sort of confidently into into a meeting that's a really important point right when the power dynamic is wrong meaning you're the beggar and the investor is a chooser, mm -hmm. th you're always going to be on the back foot. Yep. Right? And that's one of the biggest aspect that I work on with my clients is how do we level out that power dynamic? How are you the one who is not a beggar, but actually you're the one bringing an opportunity to them that's going to make them a lot of money or that's going to make them feel good about themselves, whatever their success criteria is and the driver. Um, and, th and, and that's important as well, right? Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. it's so, so most LPs and most VCs for that matter, I mean, like the main principle, f you know, fundamental reason to get into that business is to make money, right? Mm -hmm. Um, LPs are looking for returns. GPs are looking for, for carry on those returns, et cetera. But there is almost certainly, if not, you know, if not a whole kind of cohort of LPs that are looking for non-financial returns, non-financial returns, certainly over the last several years, have played a large part, whether that's impact, whether that's, you know, feeling like, um, you know, that they have access to this, you know, the coolest new deals on the planet, or whatever, right? Like, or they want to be in AI, or they want to yep. be in biotech, or they want to be in something else. Um, but but understanding that the motivations aren't necessarily only financially driven is, is would seem to be pretty important. It actually never is. Yeah. Right. Um, and 
and and sometimes it's not even financially driven. Um, so, for example, for institutional investors, right, fund of funds, mm. like you're you're going uh, to them and they have a corporate, you know, all the check boxes and all the things that they need you to have the track record and the, the pipeline and access to these cool deals that nobody else does. And really, it's it's like potato, potato, like everyone does the same thing, really. Yeah, that's where the differentiator comes in. That's where you go. No, no, this is my personal relationship. I like this guy or girl, and I trust him over five other VCs who are raising, and they have very similar thesis. Let's face it, nobody's really reinventing the wheel here. All VCs are contrarians. All VCs are conviction-led, but all of them are investing in the same stuff, right? <laughs> like, Basically. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, you know, some might be investing in more impact stuff, others more AI, the others, like, you know, it, it, yes, the, the, they're different verticals, but really, truly, people buy from people. Yeah. So... You know, you in you are investing in me as much as in my thesis, and I can have the world's best best thesis. But if I'm really a shit GP, yeah, like would you want to give me yeah, your money? Yeah, if not I'm really. if I'm not personable, if I'm not approachable, if I'm not you know if approachable, if, but also like if I d don't know how to get things done, yeah, right, how to take your money and multiply it, but also be you know, maybe charismatic to have those relationships with those founders and founders wanting to take you um, on board versus your competitors, right? To have those relationships where you get exposed to those deals that are quite unique and no nobody else get has an in, right? To have LPs on your cap table who are really going to add a lot more to your business than just the capital yeah because really money should be the bare minimum yeah that's the that's the lowest bar that you gotta you gotta get over and that's another thing right that, that i i am i usually get very surprised when i speak to founders gps it doesn't matter it's, it's the same when they're raising capital they do not know who their dream investor is yeah <laughs> they don't know yeah, yeah there's a spray and pray of like okay we're just gonna go like this fund seems cool we're gonna go to that fund but actually no but why yeah this this guy over here who's been quietly sat there deploying into this vertical for like the last 30 years mm. like very well not necessarily well known but like well known in that space and yet they don't seem to understand that actually that's the person they should be targeting not yeah not the big name over here just for the sake of the big name and that's that's where the power dynamic again gets tilted right you are going blanket approach batch and blasting your pitch emails which is oh my god another thing that we will really need to talk about like people need to stop sending their really long decks well like, i would say crazy. that people need to stop building <laughs> bloody platforms to send decks to yeah. everyone because that's <laughs> it's, it's it crazy. just doesn't work yeah okay, it's fine. crazy okay but, well, i'm glad we're on the same page there <laughs> but 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 they they're just it, there's no zero tailoring and 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 we know it i mean investors know it they know when there is a copy paste email and mm. they know when you it's this is like a cutout molded around you because you are the perfect investor for this business yeah so know who your investors are who you want and why you want them and what they can add to your business outside of just money there is a lot of money in the world like you can really get money from a lot of different places doesn't mean that you want them on board like this is like getting into bed with someone for 10 years of mm. your life, mm. you know, if you're a VC or, you know, um, institutional investor. So uh, choose your, you know, bed partners wisely. Yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> we've said it on the podcast. I'll say it again. The average founder VC and even co-founder relationship lasts longer than the average UK marriage. So like, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that kind of tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. Um, look, so, so moving on from that. And I think, you know, I, I, I think the issue around raising capital in this market, it has become harder. It hasn't become impossible. But what it means is that as a founder or as a VC, you need to be really incredibly targeted in your approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and you need to be willing, you need to be open to the fact that, you know, LPs that may have come to the table last year may not come to the table this year. And it may not have anything to do with you either. So you, you probably have to cast your net a bit wider. But casting your net wider doesn't necessarily mean that you then throw away uh, or throw out the window, you know, the nuance of the approach. Like you still got to cast the net wider for the sort of LPs or investors that you want to catch, right? You got to, you still got to find the right people. Um, and I, and I think that, 
you know, again, in this market, the thing that I, uh, the thing that I wonder about a lot is whilst it is hard to raise, I think in the same way that we say this is a great time for founders uh, to build a business, because yes, in scarce times, you know, you actually have really great businesses built. I wonder whether the same actually will will hold true um, for VCs. So we'll see great vintages for funds being raised right now because the LPs deploying into those funds are probably have probably much more conviction about the GPs that they're they're yeah. they're investing in um, than maybe five years ago when everyone was just throwing money at, at, at everything. Yeah. But but moving on from there, we connected over some quite vocal posts around diversity in VC, and we don't need to talk about the specifics of those uh, uh, posts in in in, in, um, in themselves. But I was incredibly impressed with the nuance that you brought to the conversation. So talk to me about why you think we need to get away from this sort of top-down approach uh, in venture and beyond, um, and how we can move to a more bottom-up approach, and, and how we can foster the creation uh, of data to improve diversity. Because it feels like at the moment, it's like, no, we need more women, or we need more you know, minority ethnics and the other was like, no, 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 no. We need to keep it completely meritocratic and, and, you know, the chips will fall where they may. And, and it feels like actually we should be somewhere in the middle. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'd love to get your perspective. What's equality for you? Wow. For me, that's a, that's a interesting question. What is equality? I like, think, yeah. What I, does that mean to you? I, I think for me, equality means, um, that everybody has, uh, everybody has the opportunity, if not the right uh, to, um, to, to, you know, get that job or raise that investment. Um, and, uh, uh, equally that everyone has at least the opportunity to start off from a level playing field. Right. I think, I think the thing that I really dislike and that really upsets me, and it's bizarre that I would say this because I come from privilege myself is I really don't like, you know, the, the fact that many people succeed quote unquote, off the back of the privilege that they've essentially inherited as opposed to the actions that they've taken as an individual. Exactly. <laughs> okay, good. Glad right. I got that So right. we can move on from here now. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so, but that, so you said that everyone, equality is something that when, when everyone has equal opportunity, if not the right to go for things that they want to go for, mm -hmm. whether it's a role, job role, or whatever else um, we are talking about, kind of like a corporate roles here, right? Yeah. Um, I think these days, everyone has the right, right? Legally, we can all apply for whatever role we want, whether it's a partner at the GP fund or a manager at a tech firm or whatever it is. Yeah. But do we all have an opportunity? Yeah. Um, I think there are, th that's an important part. And that's where we can really contribute to giving everyone equal opportunity to go for whatever they want. But I think it's deeper than that because a lot of people say like, well, you know, like you have an opportunity to apply, but then you are not good enough. So you didn't get hired. Fair enough. But how do we change that? Mm. Why are people not good enough to be in specific roles, right? Like why do we not have enough good, maybe female um, GP level, partner level, fund managers, uh, or do we? I don't know. Like, there are 300 the, in, the, in Europe. In Europe, yeah. yes. We've been screamed at this stat <laughs> by many people in the last couple of months. We get it. But why do still firms think or feel that it's not enough? I mean, on the grand scheme of things, 300 versus how many male we have? I don't even know. Yeah. Small fraction, yeah. right? So, but how do we change that? How do we enable more women and men to have proper education, access to that education? What kind of education are they getting for them to be able to then play in that field and be considered or even want to go for roles like a GP of the fund, right? What, what kind of upbringing or the cultures they come from? Because let's face it, I mean, in some cultures, you wouldn't even get exposed to that or almost not even have the right to go for a corporate job even, mm. right? Um, and so all of these things, we we say it is a nuance, but it's it's actually, it's a, it's a needle mover, right? It depends where we are coming from and actually fueling those countries and educating them on what is the art of the possible. Mm. 
what's possible? What are the different industries that you could actually go into and explore and see if you want to have a career in? So, so it's interesting. Sorry to interrupt again, yeah. but like I, I literally had this argument with my, I say argument, this conversation with my daughter. Um, so she ab- wants to be a GP and you were like, no, yeah, yeah, you I need like, to. I was like, you're 16. You maybe need to figure it, figure some other <laughs> stuff out before you become a GP. No, but like, like we were having a conversation because I noted like, there's there's a few people within my within my wider family who've gone into psychology as a degree, right? So she's she's currently trying to figure out what she wants to do, uh, and uh, I was like, and and I and I appreciate that there's a lot of unconscious bias that probably did come into this, but I kind I, I kind of sat there and said, but but it feels like it's become a default option for a lot of women, especially uh, young female students, to go into psychology you know, if, if there isn't something else that they're, you know, that, that, that they want to do. Um, and I kind of, it was sort of a throwaway remark because I was looking at it from my own perspective. Like I went into languages because I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. Right. I was yeah. like, okay, I'm good at languages. I'll do languages. Fine. Whatever. Right. Um, and my, my daughter just like came, came out like fists pumping, like uh, dad, th- like that is a problem. You are part of the problem. You're not part of the solution here. I'm like, okay, but hold on. What I like, but I didn't understand the what's though? the problem. Yeah. Right. And she goes, and and so from her perspective, she's saying the the reality is that, you know, um, girls in particular are still not given the same opportunities within, uh, let's say, science based fields or STEM fields. Um, they don't necessarily get the same salaries at graduation. Yeah. They don't necessarily even get the same opportunities to apply for those jobs. It's much more likely that you know a, a male science grad is going to get you know get a role versus a female one. I was like, okay, this is interesting because. You know, I, I'm sat here going, no, but we're changing and the world is changing, it's moving on. And I said, no, look, you know, lots of engineers that I know uh, certainly are female and, and all this sort of stuff. And and we kind of had these slightly entrenched positions, but then I actually went and looked at some of the research and it turns out she's kind of right. Oh, no, like, no, there, there, there are salary gaps for sure, discrepancies, absolutely. Salary gaps, like only 25%, like which has moved up from yep. 13% maybe a decade ago. Uh, entering those sort of fields, but but there is still clearly a big gap. Now, mm-hmm. on the assumption that all people are created equal, uh, and you know, they're, they're, and, and obviously the the research is is very much there that you know whether whether gender, race, uh, or, or or whatever, none of that factors. It like genes do not factor into your ability or your intelligence. What factors into intelligence typically is your social upbringing, your cultural upbringing, but also uh, at school, you know, the teachers that you have, how you as a student are empowered and able to do stuff and how you're encouraged and all these sort of things. Um, but but it basically, I was sat there, I was like, okay, yeah, I mean, may, maybe there is a, a problem, right? Oh, well, 100% there's a problem. Nobody's denying that. Yeah. Um, I think where one more thing that I would add to your list is the confidence. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. Right? That definitely came through. And, yeah. and, and that's a, that's a, a huge one. I work with both men and women on capital raise. So let me tell you, there is a massive difference how men ask for money versus how women ask for money. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so a, a similar experience I had also when I was hiring for female salespeople and male salespeople. Right. Um, You know, with men, in my experience, let's hope nobody's going to come and like crucify me for this now. But in my experience, well, we'll get more views if they do. So that's cool. (laughs) Honestly, everyone is entitled to their opinion as long as they express it respectfully. And, you know, you have a non not just a a tantrum out there and you're not being a keyboard warrior. Yeah, yeah. that's totally fine. Um, But also in my experience, you know, male investors they're like, they're like, they, they liked, there was a research actually even done on how we, women and men cross the traffic light. And I think that also um, describes pretty well how they ask for money and how they go let, for Let me it. guess, and, like me, I cross the road, irrespective of the thing, my wife, my daughters are always waiting at the side, wait until yeah. the light goes green. So exactly. Yeah, so yeah. men, when, it, when it's orange, uh, they run over and women, they come back, kind of wait for the green and then they cross the across the street. Now, th- that tells you a lot about the risk appetite, and we can talk about this for days and weeks on how and what kind of background and mm. all of that fueled that different levels of risk appetite in male and female. However, that's like a one thing that we can do as a society, right? We can empower women and men 
in schools to be better negotiators, to be better problem solvers, to analyze interactions and also apply the personal kind of psychology um, kind of strategy on top of it too, while while negotiating a big contract, an interview, a, a deal, whatever it is with their partner. I mean, it, it, it could be applied in, in all aspects of life. Mm. But I don't think that we teach these things at school to then really empower them to go and actually call 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 out the bullshit when somebody's offering them 25% or 30% less salary than their counterparts are getting or you know really present themselves in a in a in a in a position where they're the ones in charge here. I I was really shocked uh when i was hiring for for one of my businesses a couple of years ago and i, I have a friend of mine who is like this incredible coo and she's she's been on the podcast before she you know she's currently working with me as well in the business but uh, it, it, you know what she said to me i was i was going out hiring a cto and i was like oh there's this there's a cto that looks absolutely ideal she's not she wasn't a cto but she has the right background she has the right skill set she has everything the right and uh what this friend of mine said yeah but a, you've pitched, you've pitched the role as CTO, and you've pitched the salary at this level. And she said, rightly or wrongly, there will be women out there who will look at the role and look at the salary and say, no, no, that's too senior. Yeah, that that's m- more than I'm worth. Rather than a man who would probably be like way more junior would say, yeah, fuck it, I'm gonna go yeah. for that role. Right? Historically, that's how how, how it's been. Yeah. Right. And uh, there, there, there is a research as well, like backing that statistically. Um, I, I had a, actually a great example when um, I was talking to two different founders, male, female, as a, from an investor perspective. And uh, they were they were competitors. So they were in a kind of like a similar field, building the similar thing um, in pharmaceuticals. And I asked them a question around the area that neither of them had an experience in, and I wanted to know whether they would choose to expand their business down the line, if needs be, in that area. Guess the answers. I would guess that the man said, yeah, absolutely, we can take that market. We'll be looking at doing that in X, Y, Z year. And the woman probably said, I'd have to think about that. Uh, It'll depend on how we perform over the next X, Y, Z period, and we'll consider it at the appropriate time. Very close, right? The woman goes... Okay, very responsible approach, right? Like that's why also we are really, really so good with we're very good at detail oriented. We we are very good at returns, all of that because we care, mm. and so we are meticulous when it comes to okay. Like if I'm saying I'm gonna deliver something, I del- I'll deliver it, right? So she goes, well, I'll need to take this course and that course, and I don't have experience in here and here, and I need to hire this person, that person, and then I'll look at it and then I'll let you know. Yeah. While the guy goes, I'll just Google it. Yeah. Yeah. How hard can it be? It, it, it's interesting. We also find this in, in in my business where actually female founders are far more likely to come to us for CFO support, for like mm. for, for finance support, because there is an understanding of I don't know what I don't know and I don't want to bullshit my way through it. Whereas a lot of male founders will often be like, it's okay, I've been doing the finance myself and it's okay. And then sometimes we go and see see what they've done and we're like, yeah, it's a good job you brought us on because like, quite frankly, you didn't know what you're doing. Yeah, and, and it's a little bit of a gray area for me because I'm a big believer in not letting people down and being responsible with sure. people's money when you're raising capital. But also at the same time, there there is that room for just wing it. You yeah. know, like just go well, in a and, startup. You, there's you, kind of you and, have to a little bit. And, so. and every startup investor expects has a, that yeah. has a risk appetite, yeah. right? Like they wouldn't be early startup investor if they wanted a done deal, secure deal. They would be going and giving in their money somewhere else with like a five six percent yeah. annual they return. Invest in the S and P right? and you're done. Yeah. So it's like you know, be be that person who goes. You know what? I'm going to take that risk. It's a calculated risk, and let's see what happens. Yeah. And a lot of investors also want you to do that, right? Like they, like if you are just by the book, then anybody else can replace you. Anybody yeah. else can take that book and read it and implement it in. You're not going to be the outlier. You're just going to be the average, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so. And and so, like coming back to this point on kind of bottom down versus um, uh, 
uh, top up. Like, so is it, is it, do you think it is purely a function of education and environment or is there something else? And equally, I guess on the flip side, you know, all these, the, the mandates, and I, 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 I'm very clear, like mandating for diversity is not the right way around it. Right. I mean, I think what you have to do is ensure that there is a pipeline of people coming up that are the right people and that there is a diverse selection within that. And they, okay, yes, you still then got to deal with hiring biases and all those sort of things. And of course, those are challenges. I'm not belittling those at all. But it feels to me like the very start is like, okay, if you've got a field of 100 engineers, for argument's sake, and 50 of them are women and 50 of them are men, that's already stacking the odds back in not even in favor but it's at least leveling the odds mm. uh versus the current situation where it's 25 percent versus 75 and uh, the, I, again interestingly and this was the, this was what i was alluding to with the salaries i watched some tiktok or instagram kind of real and there's a guy wandering around the streets of new york asking people what they did and what their salary was and it was all engineers yeah and male engineer one year post-grad hundred and ninety thousand dollars female engineer three years post-grad hundred and forty thousand mm dollars -hmm. like it was and i i was like wow that's actually shocking like yeah. that's that's pretty crazy. and and this is such a complex subject and it, it topic and it has so many different data points and improvement areas yeah right the transparency mm. right like people don't really know what others are openly getting paid therefore they're not speaking up to say that hey you know i'm 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 underpaid, I'm being underpaid yeah. right um people don't have then confidence to even when they know to go and speak up and confront their, you know, not in an aggressive way, but like, you know, go and talk to their HR, talk to their manager and level that out, right? People are not um, taught how to combat these situations and what their rights are, right? I, I, I mean, sorry to interrupt, I keep interrupting, but it just, <laughs> it just struck me and I haven't looked at this, right? But yeah. um, I, I wonder what the data shows in terms of valuations for rounds of female founded businesses mm -hmm. versus male founded businesses. Like obviously we already know that only 2% of venture capital even Less, flow, flows yeah. towards women and, and, and minorities. But I would assume based on everything we've just talked about yeah. that you would probably see those valuations far more in the favor of the investors for, the, for, for those female founded businesses versus the male founded businesses. But equally, and I wonder whether part of not the problem, the problem's the wrong way of, of describing it, but part of that is, again, to your point, a female founder may not feel or may feel more comfortable with a realistic valuation mm -hmm. versus a highly inflated one because like, well, okay, no, I know what my business is worth. I'm not going to try and, you know, push it to this, you know, to this ridiculous uh, valuation, right? Yeah, but also ultimately there are a lot of also silent kind of bias of subconscious bias that we are not even aware of. Sure. And that's another thing that it's our job to call ourselves out and to be open to be educated and educate others. And I think that that's also super important how we do that education. And that's where, you know, the whole post that we connected over came about, right? Like the whole, this whole cancel culture and rage and uh, let me just shove it down your throat and tell you how much of a shit man you are because you are not hiring a female GP. Well, that's not going to fucking help you. Yeah. And in you fact, know? if anything, it, it makes the situation worse because now other women, other female GPs that may have read that are like, well, I'm never going to work with that guy. Yeah. Even even if that guy, Absolutely. E even if the guy is actively searching or whatever, right? It's like, hmm. it, beca it becomes problematic. Um, so, Turning the question around a little bit, right? Because yeah. controversially, you're also putting women back in the kitchen, which oh. I think is really lovely. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Do you um, like that idea? That's, that's, a, that's a super cool idea. I think you should run with that. No, but you you are putting women back in the kitchen, very tongue in cheek, at my kitchen club. Um, so talk me through the concept behind the show and uh, uh, why you felt it was important to have those conversations. So this is, you know, this is my kitchen, her story, right? Yeah. Yeah, my kitchen, her story was actually inspired by the community founder social that mm -hmm. I've started, which is an all female. Founders. We're also going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, investors community, and because I met so many inspirational, amazing women that have such diverse backgrounds, really interesting backgrounds, and they've gone through experiences that has really shaped them into an entrepreneur there today. That I think it's something that 
a lot of us don't see mm -hmm. in a boardroom, right? A lot of investors don't see, a lot of end customers don't see. And I wanted to bring these very real women who are some of them known faces, others unknown faces, and really tell their stories in a very candid, relaxed atmosphere. I'm from Georgia, which is in Eastern Europe. Food and hospitality has always been a really large part of our culture. I think so is it's every part culture of your in the world, culture. Right? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, you know, some more oh, wait, than hold others. On. I, I, I have both the Indians on the one hand who are just like force feeding me <laughs> and I have my Italian mother-in-law who is equally forced. Like, I mean, exactly. Like, are you hungry? No, no. Eat some more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> so, so that's always been part of my culture. And I have had some of the most, you know, candid and fun and m maybe difficult conversations in a kitchen over some great food and a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want it to be just yet another interview style show where I fire a question, she answers back and it's like, okay, cool. Like this could have been a CV or it could, I could have read it via email. I wanted the real personality to shine through. And so we are in the kitchen, but also uh, cooking their favorite dish. Mm. But also I think this whole extremes that we went from one extreme to another from, you know, woman in the kitchen and only raising kids and family, which is, by the way, two jobs and a half, not one and a half. And, uh, you know, that's amazing if you're doing that. But we went majority of women doing that to now society almost being extremely judgmental towards those women who are, want to do that and don't want to build some crazy career and become it, millionaires. It's like the, fe the feminism has kind of gone one extreme from the other, right? Yeah, you but know? it's also gone very much like feminism. It, 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 it's not anymore, oh, do whatever you want to do. It's more like, but do what society is telling yeah, you, you have to do. To what's do, cool yeah. to do, yeah, yeah, like yeah. what you're really supposed to do. If you're not do. doing this, then you are you are essentially anti the rest of us. Yeah, kind of thing, yeah, yeah, you're not. So I think, and I do think that these both worlds can coexist. I love what I do. I love building businesses. I have had over a decade career in big tech, but also I equally really enjoy cooking, you know, a meal for my family, taking care of them and really being that nurturing energy and a person in my family that brings everyone together. And I love it. Mm. And I think these two things are should not be exclusive to one another. I mean, look, I, I love it. I mean, the reason I love it so much as well is, you know, my wife, we're, we're middle-aged. Um, I won't I won't give away her age <laughs> on, on camera. She'll probably kill me. But look, you know, we lived out in the middle of nowhere for 10 years in New Guinea. She was like essentially a single mother for about five of those years uh, when I was traveling to and fro. Uh, and she could like, it, it just didn't make sense for her to work. So for really from the time we've been together, she hasn't, she hasn't worked. Now our kids have grown up um, and, and it's been amazing because it's allowed me to pursue what I want to do. And, you know, she's been happy uh, looking after the family, but not just looking after that. She's not just sat at home doing nothing else, but you yeah. know, she, she, oh, nothing else. I mean, there's like a whole, there's a whole bunch of, of stuff she's doing anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but now with the kids having grown up quite substantially, she's started pursuing a degree, right. For the first time in her life and, and she's loving it. Um, and I, I don't see all of these things as mutually exclusive, Often it comes down to timing. Like I'd love to retire today, but that's not going to happen. So I'm going to have to work for another yeah. probably 20, 30 years. And right? that's <laughs> exactly the part that goes also very much underappreciated a lot of the times. So I think a lot of the spotlight is shed on women were not able to work and we're not allowed to work. Okay. But also, why are we not talking about the other side where men are so... So th they were always under so much pressure to provide. Mm. And that's a, a lot of, like, that's a big responsibility to constantly be the provider. The livelihood of your children and a wife is really depending on how well you work and you go and earn that money and bring it home. I feel seen. I really do. Okay. <laughs> you pay me tomorrow. <laughs> well, look, let, let's, I mean, let, let's explore that a bit further because we've had a few guests on the pod who have built female founder and angel focused community similar yeah. to founder social right but and we talked about this i find myself asking whether it would make sense to consolidate these communities or do you believe they each bring different values to the table and also i wonder and, and again you and i both had had 
probably similar feelings on this. Like, what would happen if you got a bunch of guys who said we're going to do a male only, uh, you know, community? Um, and how would that land? I mean, I, I I think that's a really interesting. I mean, like, we all know about male clubs, right? Like, so ma male members only clubs, mm -hmm. which you know I have a problem with as well. I would say I I actually have a problem with anything that is exclusionary I, I i like a world where we're inclusive of everything that makes me probably mm. very left-wing wokey whatever it is but um yeah I, I mean talk me through why in your opinion maybe there are so many of these these communities and and uh and and whether each of them has a separate role to play or if there is something more kind of common amongst them yeah i think look these communities are usually created because of the demand. Mm -hmm. So my community, there, there was no plan to launch that, launch it. It was, it started from like me organizing a dinner for four, four of us, uh, four women. And uh, first dinner, then we ended up having 15 women. And now we have over 3000 women cross platform, right? Like just on just over a year after. And that's all by word of mouth. And all because, you know, there are women out there who felt that they wanted to be part of this community. And why this community is because it's very energetically quite different. It's no corporate, uh, although we have a ton of corporates in there, right? It's not um, uh, it's not only driven by who you are, how well you pitch, or how much you invest, or whatever else, right? Like it's very much like what do you need today? How mm -hmm. can I help you rather mm -hmm. than how can I take from you? Mm -hmm. And that's very much the thesis of the community and we stick to it very strictly. There is no sales policy. There is only, you can only offer your help and then, then if you get the business out of it by, by the end of it, then great. And we have investments coming out of it. We have partnerships coming out of it. We have people made, making friends, meeting their co-founders. I mean, really amazing and it's really just there to make you feel not alone as a female founder because we do not still have that many of the, them. the community is still small yeah right the community is much smaller when it when it comes to like uh, versus the male founders and actually one of the day um one of the female founder posted on the community saying that hey my husband is a newly new new founder and he would love to do, you know, like to join a group, something like this, where it's just male founders or even just founders. But for him, it was like a male founders. And I was like, why don't you tell him to start it? Mm. You know, it's not it's not something that, oh, we are here because we do not accept men. No, it's more like we are women. We do. We like it or not. We have a lot of commonalities sure. when it comes to shared experiences, shared experiences and um, sh shared challenges mm. uh, because of plethora of things that we've discussed earlier. And so it's easier to kind of support one another and share our experiences and learn from it and really kind of twist it and make quick changes rather than when you feel too awkward to talk about it because they're like, you know, other men. Uh, there the, are the, like the, the, you awful, feel... the awful phrase is a safe space. Safe, safe space. Pla space. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But, but when you said, you know, can we, you know, unify them all? We have no problem. We partner with other communities. We co-host dinners um, and events all the time. And uh, again, this is not some like a raging feminism group that, you know, they they want to kill all, all mankind. Yeah. <laughs> all I mean, I was, be, I was being somewhat tongue in cheek as well. I mean, I guess because yeah. one could ask, what, you know, why are there six businesses selling CRMs? It's because they're, they're, there is always... A quote unquote customer yeah. uh, for what you're selling, right? Like if if you are offering a slightly different experience or in a slightly different geography or in a slightly different way, slightly yeah. different focus, people will come to where they feel comfortable, where they have other people that they yeah. know who are already there. Um, and and look, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of of most of these communities because, you know, I, whilst it always surprises me that despite all the information that's out there, there are still lots of founders that don't understand various things or don't know where to look for certain things or whatever. Um, and maybe that's just because, okay, I've been doing this for a while and I kind of know, and I've, I've, you know, I've, I've figured some stuff out, but just being, sometimes just being able to ask a question without having to go and research the fuck out of everything, like is, oh, yeah. is really valuable. And, right? and our WhatsApp group has over 900 women on it. Wow. And 
and it has a sh- I, I can't no I can't even cope with like WhatsApp groups with 30 people on them like I'm just like <laughs> but, I, actually there's but, one I'm on with like six people and it does my head but in, so, that's yeah. the thing so th- imagine a group of 900 plus women with zero spam mm-hmm. zero social kind of like non-helpful yeah, chat just chatty, yeah. nothing yeah and it's kind of also shaped into this crazy recommendation engine where somebody posts a question but like I don't know I need a supply chain manager in Missouri <laughs> and and somebody in five seconds is like got the guy <laughs> sending you the DM and it's just like <laughs> like where like how do you guys even know these people yeah. and it's just like the power of the reach and the community and because of so many of us and everyone is just it's, there it, to help it's a network effect right like yeah. of, of the 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 whole is greater than the sum of its parts yep i think that's wonderful um so look to close off this is a new addition to the podcast i, I thought i tried out but i'd love um for you to tell me about one thing that you have a really contrarian conviction about from area, any area of life, whether that's work, politics, socially, or at home, what is the hill that you would die defending? I'm not sure how contrarian it is, but I think um, ev- all of us were a result of our experiences. Mm-hmm. And w- none of us were born angry or traumatized or evil or with their egos, right? We all pick up these things depending on what we go through life, what we go through Mm -hmm. in our lives. Mm -hmm. And if we spend a little bit more time understanding what is behind that person's maybe moody face today or or abrupt response, maybe we'll improve at least a percentage of our interactions and experiences that we are getting from those people. And maybe even, you know, contribute to the betterment of their day. And and I've been I've been on the kind of wrong side of my own advice as well for m- many times. And we're not all perfect. And oh my God, I'm I'm not sitting here preaching like Please be kind to one another and never, you know, judge and get angry. We all do it. Let's face it. Okay. Like we all have that. But really, if we train ourselves to dig into it and really understand, okay, like what it is, what what is it that made you, like that triggered you, that mm. really made you flip at me this way, then I can really, then we can have a better relationship. And it might be not, we are not for one another, corporately or personally, but it's it's an easier, less kind of like holding a grudge type of relationship than yeah. not, uh, not uh, understanding one another. And so it's understand before you react, I guess, is the... Ask the question. Yeah. Right? Ask a question and uh, really deep dive into it, right? Like I can, I can ask you for something. I can ask you like, hey, I want a salary raise. And you'd be like, no. Interesting. Is it because you don't have a budget? Is it because you don't think that I'm valuable? Like, you know, and usually you get to something that's like quite personal Mm. or out of their control. Mm. And either way, then you kind of have your closure that people like to call it or the answer and you know how to go. Um, Yeah, I I think, yeah, I think that's super valuable. I mean, I think if, if a lot of us shed our egos a little bit in these sort of conversations. I, again, coming back to my daughter, you know, her and I both uh, slightly ADHD. Well, no, we're both, we both have ADHD. <laughs> so we often get into these entrenched positions. Yeah. But actually, if we just took the time, I think, to sit down and say, well, hold on a second. Why why today is this the position you've taken? Then maybe yeah. we, and, we'd and, have a better... And strip away your ego. Yeah. That's one thing that I spent years on working. And sometimes it still snakes in. But... Our ego is our worst enemy because it clouds our judgment. It gets us worked up and ultimately we're making wrong decisions because of that ego. Yeah, it took me 18 months of therapy to figure that (laughs) that out. So um, listen, Tamta, it's been absolutely incredible having you here in the studio with me today. For our audience, where is the best place for them to find you online? You're on LinkedIn. I know you're on LinkedIn, but you're on LinkedIn, Twitter. (laughs) Where can they find you? Um, Thank you so much for having me. This was really great. Um, so I am on LinkedIn. Tamta Gamazardashvili. Good luck to everyone who is typing that. Um, and <laughs> I just realized I've got to say it again. 
<laughs> you better provide them with a typed out kind of like the full name and the link to it. Um, and our founder social community, if anyone wants to join, if you're a female investor or a founder, please come join us. We're on LinkedIn where you have a sign up link uh, and you can register really simply within a couple of seconds and join our amazing community. It's under Founder Social. And for My Kitchen, Her Story, we are at the moment on YouTube and on Instagram. Mm -hmm. But very soon, we're having a little TV rollout. Oh, maybe. Ooh, maybe. Ah, watch mm -hmm. this space. You heard it here first. Heard it here <laughs> that is true. first. <laughs> that is true. Yes. Um, but My Kitchen, Her Story, Instagram and YouTube at the moment, and Unorthodox Ventures is very much under radar type of um, uh, position. And we have a LinkedIn page for it, but please DM uh, me or one of my associates for further information on that. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.